A word from our sponsor. A word from God. With the young people in mind on this their day, but also for us, the other young people, the church. From the prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, just seven verses. I don't have it on PowerPoint this week. I didn't get around to that. Um, I had uh, all this other stuff going on, uh, and um, so I didn't get around to it. <laughs> I didn't even give Tim a copy of the message this morning. Um, do whatever you have to do to get yourself ready once again to hear the word of God. Get comfortable, get relaxed, and I want you to use all your senses, your imagination, your eyes, your ears, your nose, um, just to soak it up, soak it in, so that you can get the picture, get the picture of what I'm trying to get across, this message for the young people, for the confirmands, this message for all of us, for the church. Isaiah is having a vision in this passage of scripture. And he begins with these words, in the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah had been king, a good king, a godly king for 52 years. That's a long time. A lot of people have come and gone. People have grown up with this king. People have died and passed on. Generations have been in this king's rule. Uh, so that, that says something by itself. But it was that particular year that he died that Isaiah's having this vision. And Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Right away we get this picture of a bride and her train and how long sometimes they seem. I know we're always shifting them around so it looks beautiful and it, you know they can be long and sometimes in the way and you're tripping over them and everything. But it looks beautiful you know, when the bride is up here and the maid of honor has to shift the, robe, uh, the train around so it looks beautiful. But the, the king, the Lord, is sitting high and exalted on his throne and the train of his robe fills the temple and above him were seraphim seraphim are a class of angels there's a number of different kinds of angels we're familiar with cherubs the little rosy-cheeked fat ones okay you know and then we're familiar with uh, uh, other angels or warrior type angels and then there's this class of seraphim each with six wings we don't know how many angels there were how many of these seraphim there were. Scripture says that Christ at any moment could call upon ten thousands, thousands upon thousands of angels to assist him, to help him in any way that he wanted to. Ten thousands upon ten thousands of angels, legions of angels to help him out if he needed be. So here in the throne room of the temple where God sits, you know, uh, there's all these angels. This is just one class of angels. And um, these seraphim each had six wings. And with two of the wings, they covered their faces. Covered their eyes. With two of the wings, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. They were calling to one another. These innumerable amount of angels calling out to one another and this is what they were saying holy 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 is the lord almighty the whole earth is full of his glory holy 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 and at the sound of their voices you can just imagine that sound at the sound of their voices the doorposts shook and the thresholds of the doors shook and the temple filled with smoke. And Isaiah, who's seeing all of this, says, uh-oh. Woe is me. 
I cried. I'm in deep trouble. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And now my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal, a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with this burning coal, he touched my mouth and he said, See, this has touched your unclean lips and your guilt your uncleanness is taken away and your sin is atoned for. It's covered over. It's wiped away. It's erased. And then, Isaiah says, then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, whom shall I send and who will go for us? <laughs> and then I can almost imagine Isaiah said, Saying, you know, then I heard a voice saying, here am I, send me. And Isaiah's standing there like this, looking around saying, who in the world volunteered for that? Who am I, send me? And then he realized it was him. It was his voice he heard, you know. Who, who was the nut that dared volunteer and thought that they could stand up and volunteer and respond. And he realized it was him. Look what's going on in this passage. Isaiah's having this vision. And in this vision, all of his senses are being brought into play. Sight, sound, words, hearing, emotions, and things beyond the imagination. And it's awe-inspiring. His jaws dropping. You know? And it's like unbelievable. It's like some of these movies that I watch, you know, with all the action going on. I just sit there and I realize, you know, 15, 20 minutes into the movie, my, my mouth is open. You know, one of my kids say, Dad, close your mouth, you know? Uh, all the action. It's just, uh, I'm just so amazed. And Isaiah probably standing there like that, just seeing all these angels flying around and all this noise and odors and smells and sounds and everything going on. It's just, it's just bewildering. And then in verse 3, the angels start calling out to one another. And they start saying, holy, holy, holy. Probably singing it out. Probably sounding amazingly beautiful. Better than this music that we're doing. Hard to believe though, huh? But uh, this is the only time in Scripture where we find an attribute of God, a characteristic of God, in this case, God's holiness. It's the only time in Scripture where we'll find uh, the, an attribute of God repeated three times in a row. Elsewhere in Scripture, we read that God is what? God is what? What's that? Don't be afraid. God, the Bible says God is love, right? Do you ever read or have you ever heard the Bible say God is love, love, love? Have you heard that? No, no, you won't find it, okay? But here it says holy, holy, holy. Three times, okay? In Jewish culture, when something was meant to be emphasized, it was repeated two times. That was the custom, two times. In John chapter 1, verse 51, Jesus is talking to his disciples and his followers, and he begins his words by saying, Truly, truly, I say unto you. Do you remember that? Truly, truly, I say unto you. Okay? This means what he was saying after that, what he was telling them he was going to do, was absolutely true. Truly, truly, 
That was what that meant. In fact, the Greek word is for truly is amen. Did you know that? When you say amen at the end of a prayer, what you're saying is truly. Truly. You ever heard a preacher preaching and then he's, he or she is preaching along and they say amen and then they say, can I get an amen? I've said that sometimes. You ever heard that? Shake your head if you're with me, okay? All right, can I get an amen? Yeah. amen. Okay, all right. What is happening there is they're asking for that second truly, that affirmation that is, yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, I got it, okay? I'm in agreement. Here in Isaiah, God's holiness is repeated, not just the second, but to the third degree. Debbie Letham went to Czechoslovakia and came back, and she was emailing and sharing uh, with her friends, and I happen to be one of them, you know, and uh, it was uh, that she learned that... Uh, in Czechoslovakia, a colloquial particle is yo, 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 and which means or is translated yep, 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 or yeah, yeah, yeah. So when people are in conversation and they say yo, 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 they are agreeing with you. They are affirming what you are saying. They get it. They understand it, and they're saying, yep, yep, I'm right with you. I understand it. I get it. Okay? This three, yo, yo, yo. Here we have God's holiness repeated not just to the truly, truly second degree, but to the third degree, which means he is infinitely holy. In contrast, the Antichrist has a number attributed to him. What is that? 666, which is evil to the third degree. All right? But anyway, back to this holiness. This infinite holiness that God has, that Isaiah is witnessing, and Isaiah hears the angels saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This holiness, this majesty, this power this amazing experience of God stands in great contrast, stark contrast, to Isaiah. And you can just imagine Isaiah standing there and feeling so small, so puny, and so filthy. And, you know, and that's, he actually says, woe is me. You know, I am a man of unclean lips. I am filthy rags. I am nothing. How, you know, how can I even be standing here? in such holiness. Isaiah feeling like you or I would probably feel. And yet, and yet, all of what you or I or Isaiah feels that would make us feel so small, so puny, so filthy, so unholy is removed. And it's taken away, not by anything that you or I or Isaiah does or can do, but by God's holiness, by God's wanting to do, by God's love for us, by God's grace, and by God's willingness. You've no doubt heard the familiar breakup line in comedy shows and jokes when one person is breaking up with another one and the one person uh, you know, receives the news and they're crying and they're sobbing and they're saying, well, what can I do? What have I done? And everything like that. And the other person says, oh, no, no, it's not you. It's, it's me. You heard that? Okay. Well, listen to those words as if Jesus was speaking them and realize how he would use them not to break up, but rather to attach, to unite us to him. And if he said, it's not you, it's me. It's not you, it's me. 
when we truly understand what he's saying, then we can say, yes, it's not me. It's you. It's not me that makes me holy. It's you. It's not me that makes me stand before the holiness of an awesome God. It's you. It's you, God. And it's you, Christ. It's not me. And with this wonderful, great revelation, with this wonderful, great realization, our response then to God calling us in our lives, whenever and however he calls us, throughout our lives, young people from now on, the rest of us, every day of our lives, our response should be like Isaiah's. Here I am, send me. Because it's not that wimpy little hand in the back of the crowd saying, here I am, send me. And it's not that that who in the world dared say, here I am, send me, and us looking around. And it's not that it's more than if you can find anything useful in me, God, well, here's this pile of scrap. You're more than welcome to use it. No, it's not that at all. Rather, it's God, in you, I see how valuable I truly am. I see how precious I really am. I see how much worth I can be. And Lord, take it all and use it, not for my gain, not for my glory, but all for yours. Now you get the picture? Here I am. Send me. Not because of me, but because of you in me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for who you are and the love you have for who we are. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes it possible to bring us together. That we might be able to stand before you and all of your holiness And to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Send me wherever you would have me go to do whatever you would have me do. To be your person. To be your people. To give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Do I get an amen? Amen. Amen.